Morning, Mount Hall. Morning, Yesterday when I looked out the window, <laughs> I was a little bit intimidated about this. We all were. <laughs> place and that 2,000 years ago he rose from the dead. And that's what makes this real. That's what makes this worth doing. I want to ask that you would be with us today and that we would honor you, that you would be blessed by our praise, and that we would learn, that we would fellowship in the way that has been allowed. And I just, you know, we look forward to the day when we can circle around your throne and not be afraid of anything else. Hallelujah. Soon. Ask this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. So I've got three songs. The first one is one you probably don't know, so I just want to sing it to kind of kind of start us off. And then we'll sing a couple that I think everybody knows. And then it'll be Bob's turn. <laughs> The day dawned in confusion like a nightmare with no end. Tired and dreary colors, ragged hopes that wouldn't mend. The grief and fear of death just seemed to hang across the sky, and the pain just kept on burning. My tears had all been dry. We were talking as we journeyed toward a quiet country town. When another traveler asked us why we seemed so sad and down, it was like a dam that burst inside as I told my grief and woe. Amazed that someone leaving there could somehow still not know. Shouting to each other. 
together now. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. When Craig would tell you to be seated, but you already are. Let's see how loud you can be, Boundary County. He is risen. He is risen. <laughs> I love it. God is good, isn't he? Amen. No coronavirus. No John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Thomas Jefferson, one of our nation's founding fathers, was a great man, a visionary man, yet he could not accept and believe the miraculous parts of the Bible. He edited his own special version in which all references to the supernatural acts of Jesus Christ were deleted. Jefferson, when he edited the Gospels, he confined himself solely to the moral teachings of Jesus Christ. The closing words of Jefferson's Bible are these, quote, There they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher and departed, end quote. Thank God that is not the way the story really ends, is it? Amen. We serve a risen, powerful Savior, amen? Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's what I love to hear. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. Amen. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have, have not yet ascended to my father, but, I, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you as a church family, a church body out here today. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we, we know that no government mandate, no virus can stop the fact that you defeated death Hallelujah. and that you are alive today. We thank you for this privilege, Lord, where we come together. Mm -hmm. We ask that you would open the word up to our eyes right now, that you mm -hmm. would give us eyes to see and ears yes, to Jesus. hear your voice. I pray for your, a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit right now. I ask mm -hmm. that you would lead us and guide us in truth. And I pray if I say anything that is not of you, Lord, that it falls to the ground unheard. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray it all in your holy name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So Friday at Golgotha, it's past. The crucifixion is over. The very best that Satan could do is done. He has done his worst. Golgotha, that mount where Jesus was crucified on, the name means, and it comes from the Aramaic or the Syrian word, meaning the place of the skull. Now the hill actually looks like a skull cap that you can go there today, and it's carved into the side of the hill. The Latin word for that place is Calvary, the cross at Calvary. 
Just outside of Golgotha was a tomb that was given to Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. Now, you can visit there today, but that tomb is empty. Amen. It was empty then, and it's empty now. Amen. Interestingly, the place of Golgotha is right next to a very busy, very trash and dirty filled bus station. When I saw it, it struck me how appropriate that Jesus Christ had come to a place so dirty, just like the world that we live in, he came to save us because we live in that dirty world. And that tomb is empty, and we have hope because of it, because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And again, during this tough time, during these times of trials and tribulations that we're all going through, with this virus and with the economic things that are affecting everybody's aspect of life, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord through this. Amen. God is faithful and he will get us through this time. Amen. This did not surprise him. This is not a mistake. This is all part of his plan. In Christ, though, we are more than conquerors. We're not just going to get through this and survive, but we are going to thrive. Amen. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 36 through through 39 as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and now it's Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And it's a privilege with, for me to be with you here Amen. all today. Whether you are out here in our parking lot with the beautiful northern Rocky Mountains all around us on a crystal clear cold morning, and I still have my Hawaiian shirt on, although I'd be a little crazy to take this jacket off right now. Or if you're joining us online through Facebook Live, welcome this morning as we worship the risen Savior. Amen. So let's begin in our text in John chapter 20, verse 1, and my message title this morning is The Empty Tomb. Mm -hmm. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So in this gospel account, we're going to focus this morning on just Mary Magdalene. The other gospels indicate there were other women particularly other Marys. That seemed to be a very popular name during that time, which it's an interesting name. The name Mary actually means bitter or bitterness. And so it wasn't always a happy story, particularly when we're talking about the mother of Jesus. She had a very, very rough life. Now this woman, Mary Magdalene, as we look at her, we see that it's the first day of the week. And of course, the first day of the week is Sunday. And on a Hebrew calendar, and this goes back to Genesis, the day of the week always started with the night. So Sunday actually began for us on Saturday night at sundown. So the night first was part of the day, and then the day was one day. So it would have been Saturday night beginning at dusk into Sunday during the day or daylight hours, and then Monday, of course, would start that following sundown. Because it's always, as the Bible says, the evening and the day. And the scripture tells us this is Mary of Magdala, or what the Bible calls Mary Magdalene. She was there. The Gospel of Luke said that G Jesus had cast out seven demons out of her. And this is recorded over in Luke chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, and where it says, And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Now, Magdalene was not her last name, but it referred to the region where she was from. And this was a town or region up in the northern Galilean region of Israel. Verse 3, And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stuart, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So this tells us that these women, along with Mary Magdalene, they had wealth, they had money, and they provided for Jesus and his ministry from their wealth. Now many have labeled Mary Magdalene as a prostitute, but there's absolutely nothing in God's word that substantiates that. The notion that she was a prostitute didn't come about until the 6th century AD under Pope Gregory. 
And he confused and got and said that Mary Magdalene was the same as Mary of Bethany. So that's where all that began. And he had it that she was a repentant lady of the night. But the Bible doesn't say that, not in context. So Mary got labeled with a bad rap. Now the word says that Mary arrived before first light, sometime before 6 a.m. And she already sees that this great stone had been rolled away from the opening to the tomb. Now Bible scholars agree that that stone, that great circular carved out stone, weighed approximately 2,700 pounds. So more than a ton. And the stone also bore the signet seal of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And anyone that would break that seal without his permission would have been under a death sentence from the Roman government. But as Mary arrives in the pre-dawn hours, the stone is already gone. It's already rolled away. Verse 2, Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Mary, she sees the open and empty tomb, and she runs back to where the disciples are all staying. And she speaks to Peter, and she speaks to John. Now Peter, this was the same disciple who just three days before had denied Jesus three times. Probably the only one that would have anything to do with Peter right now was John. Everybody else would have been staying clear from Peter because of the fact that Peter had denied Jesus. He wouldn't have had a particularly good name right then and there. But despite his denial, what we see about Peter is that Peter wept and he repented from his sin. He repented quickly. He cried out to the Lord for forgiveness. The difference between Peter and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed Jesus, was that Peter repented of his sin, but Judas did not. Amen. Now, notice here, there's a difference, because Judas certainly felt bad. He recognized that he had shed innocent blood, that he had caused Jesus to be crucified, and Jesus had nothing to do with it. He was innocent of all that. But where Judas felt bad and even returned the blood money to the temple priests, which the Bible records was 30 pieces of silver, there was no indication that Judas did anything but feel bad. He never turned away from his sins, and we know the account that he ended up hanging himself. But the second disciple who is mentioned here is the one whom Jesus loved. Now, we believe this to be John the Beloved, the, the author of this book. Now, it's interesting, this was John's unique way of referring to himself in the third person. And John, of course, was a fisherman. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. And John was the only disciple recorded to have actually been there when Jesus was crucified. The others had abandoned him. And we see this over in John chapter 19, one, one chapter before this, from verses 25 through 27. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So if any of you are old enough to remember the old Bob Newhart show, you remember that there were a couple people mentioned in that. You had this guy that would come in and say, hi, my name is Daryl. This is my brother, Daryl. And this is my other brother, Daryl. Well, this is kind of like the same thing. We have all these people named Mary, and a couple of them at least are from the same family. Then going on in verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw that his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that that disciple took her to his own home. So Mary goes to two of Jesus' inner circle. Peter, James, and John were the three disciples that Jesus made privy to all the super good things, like the Mount of Transfiguration for one. But if anyone would know anything, it would have been these three. And she tells them that the tomb is open. And not just that, but the tomb is empty. Verse 3, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and were going to the tomb. So Peter and John, they leave the home where all the disciples were staying. And they were probably in hiding at this point. They were afraid that the Jewish religious leadership was going to do the same thing to them that had been done to Jesus Christ. Verse 4, so they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter 
and came to the tomb first. Now you can't help but see the dig here. This is how human these guys are. So John, of course, is writing this account, and he humbly refers to him, himself as the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But you see the rivalry between John and Peter that's displayed here. Now these guys are Jesus' inner circles, but John has got to point out, he can't miss the fact that he beat Peter to the tomb. He outran him in this foot race. At this point in time, Peter was probably about the same age as the Lord, maybe a little bit older. But John, he was the youngest of all the, the apostles. He was thought to be about 24 years old at this point in time. So it's quite obvious that John should beat Peter, Peter to the tomb. No big deal, right? But you see the humanity in these guys. They're just like us. And in their writings, just simple men trying to record what they saw through the leading of the Holy Spirit, they point out, or in this case, John points out, hey, Peter, I beat you. Verse 5, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. So John looks inside, but he didn't enter in. Now, the tomb was certainly large enough. It was large enough for him to walk in and actually go and take a look inside, but he didn't. Perhaps it was he didn't want to disrespect the dead. Or maybe it was the Jewish feeling that if he got around anything dead, that he would be defiled. But he looks in and he sees the linen. And the actual wording there refers to linen strips of cloth. So there are strips of cloth that are lying there. These are used for burial purposes. And it's lying there on the stone bench. Now the word that's used there for the word saw, it's the word theory from where we get our word to theorize. And it means to scrutinize or examine. So it's a picture of John, and he's trying to examine the physical evidence. He's trying to put himself in the place and make wrap his head around it, try and figure out what happened here, trying to see what the evidence actually said. Verse 6, Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So again, we have Peter here, who denied Jesus three times. He sinned much, but he was also forgiven much. Amen. And Peter didn't, hes <clears throat> excuse me. Peter didn't hesitate. Peter was bold. Peter was brash. Even after he sinned, this was the reason why God had picked Peter. God turned Peter, whose name, original name Simon meant hearer, or kind of like a hearer of, a, of the word, he turned him into Peter the rock, who would be a strong rock for Jesus Christ. But Peter goes in very bold, and just like many of us, that boldness would sometimes get Peter in trouble, didn't it? So Peter, he looks around, and remember, Peter would become the primary teaching apostle when the church first began. He was the one that approached the Sanhedrin and spoke boldly. Peter was also the same guy that originally took the gospel to the Gentiles, to the Samaritans. So Peter would be used mightily by the Lord. And Peter sees this head covering, the handkerchief. Now this could have been referred, this could have been the same garment that's referred to as the Shroud of Turin. We don't know, but we know that the Shroud of Turin bears the image of a crucified man of about that age, of about that stature, and it has real blood on it. The word says it was folded neatly. It wasn't just dumped, but it was folded. This was deliberately folded. Now the mixture of ointments that was used, the ointments and the aloes and spices that would have been used when Jesus was buried in that tomb, <coughs> excuse me, would have hardened and it would have left Jesus in a sort of cocoon or mummy-like state. The normal remo removal of those wrappings would have required a cutting or a tearing away, not a neat and folded manner like John and Peter found there. It was as if that Jesus' body had just evaporated and then the head cloth had left bearing the shape and the, and the uh, image of Jesus Christ. It retained the shape and the contour of Jesus' head. And it says this neatly folded and separated from the other burial pieces there 
on the altar. Verse 8. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. Now as they say, seeing is believing, right? John, where he first paused, he now goes in. A little more boldness. And he sees these wrappings. He sees that the tomb is empty. And it says that he believes. The king is alive. Jesus is risen. The Greek Amen. word there for saw that's used is Eden, meaning to understand or perceive the significance. So John at this point, he gets it. He perceives that Jesus is not there and that he is risen from the dead. He understood. Verse 9, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Again, that Greek word for know is edo, and it means to perceive with your own eyes. It's one thing to hear something, but to see it with your own eyes makes it very real. And Jesus, again and again, remember, he had taught the disciples that the Son of Man must be betrayed, the Son of Man must be put to death, and the Son of Man will rise again from the dead. This is recorded over in Luke chapter 9, verses 21 and 22, where it says, And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. Hallelujah. So Mary, John, and Peter, they all watched prophecy being lived out right before their very eyes. And they knew Jesus best. They knew him better than anybody. But they did not truly in their own hearts believe. They had heard Jesus say these things, but it's kind of like the difference between when we hear somebody or when we're actually truly listening to somebody. Verse 10. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So when they're talking about the disciples here, we're not talking about Mary, but they're talking about Peter and John. Peter and John left, but Mary stayed. Now Peter and John also heard Jesus telling the Pharisees, and this is recorded in John 2, Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Remember, they were there for that. These disciples heard that, but they probably, like everybody else, thought that Jesus was actually talking about the temple in Jerusalem and not his body, not the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because everything that Jesus did, including rising again from the dead, he did by the Holy Spirit power. The same Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you and me as a believer. So they heard it, but they really weren't listening. They didn't get it yet. And now it's starting to sink in. Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John were all, no doubt, trying to wrap their heads around this. That Jesus was alive. That tomb was empty. There was hope. Death is defeated. They sought him. They sought Jesus. They sought God first time in the morning. And that's what we should do as Christians, is to seek the Lord first thing in the morning. That's the best time as a Christian that you can do your devotional time. When you're fresh, before the world starts getting in the way. That's when you should seek the Lord in prayer and Amen. open up his word. So Mary, she sought him above everybody else. She was the one that was out there prepared to do the dirty work. She sought God in the morning and she tried to give Jesus her best. And now she's waiting there because she knows that God is faithful. Her Amen. questions are going to be answered. God is faithful even when we are not. Wrap your head around that. God is faithful even when we are not. Amen. This is a promise that's given us in the Old Testament. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. His compassions, his mercies, his faithfulness is new every morning. That means even when we blow it, just like Peter as Christians, guys, we can always come back and God has open arms waiting for us. He is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. Verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Now, Peter and John, they went home. The men left. But here is this lowly woman, Mary. She stayed. She stood by. She's outside the tomb crying. 
And that word used in the Greek means to wail or mourn. So Mary, unlike Peter and John, she's still not quite wrapping her head around this yet, that Jesus is alive. She is wailing, mourning. This was very common in that culture, particularly for the women. When somebody died, they would make a great show of wailing and mourning to show that that person was greatly loved. And she loved her Lord greatly. She is mourning for her God. She is seeking where he must be. So she stoops down and she looks inside again. And it says that she looked. And the Greek word that's used there is ice. And it means to look into or to place herself in through the entrance. Again, Mary is trying to visualize where could Jesus have gone? She's visualizing the interior of that tomb, trying to wrap her head around it. Verse 12. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. So these two angels, they're both in white. And that word that means in the original language is leukos. And it means brilliant white, glowing white. So it's quite obvious that these are angels. These are heavenly beings, all powerful type angels, messengers of God, there for a reason. So these two angels, one is at the head of the bench, and one is at the foot. And now the platform is in the middle. This is where Jesus' body had lain. This is where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had taken the body, and along with Mary had anointed him with aloe and spices and myrrh, and prepared his body for The same bench where Jesus' bloody body would have weeped onto that stone bench. He would have laid there on that very same platform, carved into the stone. Now that blood, that blood is the same blood which cleanses my sins and cleanses your Amen. sins for all time. That's how much God loves us, that he sent his Thank son you, Jesus, Jesus to die on that cross. So hold your thought about that for a second. Hold your place there in John and turn over to Exodus chapter 25 in your Bibles, please. Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, beginning at verse 8. And let me make me, excuse me, let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And they shall make it an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half, half its height. So again, a cubit is from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your finger. So approximately 18 inches is one cubit. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the, the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I give you. Now the testimony, that would have been the Ten Commandments or the law. And along with that, along with uh, some of the manna bread to remind them of their time going through the wilderness. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim. A cherubim is an angel. A cherubim is an angel. Two cherubim of gold, of hammered work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. So one on one side, one on the other. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. And you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. Then the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat, you shall put the testimony I will give you, and I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat 
from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So what we see here, or what Mary Magdalene saw that morning and was blessed to see, and I wish I could have seen it, I bet a lot of you wish you could have seen it too, is a lived out real example of the ark and, uh, of the covenant. This is God's mercy seat. Remember, Jesus' body laid on that platform. His body, broken and bruised and battered for you and for me, was our Lamb of God, our sacrifice. And he was laid on that platform. Then you have one angel or cherub on one side and one cherub or angel on the other side. And this is now an empty platform because Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. There we go. You were a little slow on that one, but we'll get there. So Mary, Mary who waited on the Lord, is treated to see for herself this picture, this typology of the Ark and the Covenant, and a real mercy seat, a mercy seat for all time that doesn't have to repeat, be repeated year after year by a priest. But God covered all of our sins once and for all through Hallelujah. the blood of Jesus Christ. But what exactly does it mean for us to wait on the Lord as Mary had waited on the Lord? Well, in the Old Testament, the term usually refers to God's provision for life, like food and water and things such as that. In the New Testament, though, it has a decidedly different term. It, for us, it means that we should all be expecting at any moment the imminent return of Jesus Christ to come back for his church. Amen. The great harpazo, or what's called the rapture, the snatching away of the church from planet Earth. To wait on the Lord involves a complete dependence on God, allowing him to control both the terms and the timing. The terms and the timing. Why? Because no man knows the hour or the day when Jesus will come back. Only the Father in heaven. So to wait on the Lord means that we produce character in our life by following what it says in his precepts. By trying to line up our life as close as possible to his example that's given in the Bible. Waiting on the Lord means to rest in the Lord. Mm. Now it's interesting, Jesus' great, great, great grandfather, King David, he was a shepherd before God called him to be king of Israel. And it was very common for him to be out in the field with the sheep. That's where the prophet Samuel found him. He was out tending to the sheep. And Psalm 23, which King David wrote, is a picture of being still. It's a picture of waiting on God and resting on the Lord. You see, sheep are not at peace. They're not at rest near rushing water. So if you are a shepherd and you take sheep near a raging river, they don't want to be anywhere around that. But they will lie down next to still water or a calm lake. That's what a good shepherd does. The good shepherd, Jesus Christ, leads us beside still waters. The words, he makes me lie down, can be translated, he causes me to rest or gives me rest. When we, like sheep, are still, we are resting on the Lord and we're trusting in our good shepherd. Now, we may not always know what God will do in our lives at that particular moment, but we know that God always has a plan for our good, to Amen. prosper us, Amen. not to harm us, to give us a future and a hope. So even with this coronavirus, trust in the Lord. Amen. Even with the government mandates, trust in the Lord. This doesn't surprise him. And remember, his timing and his plans are always perfect. Amen. Verse 13, back in our text. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? This is the angels talking. She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So the angels speak, and it must have been simultaneously, because it doesn't say one than the other, but they both say the same thing. Mary might have heard him in stereo. We don't know. But have you ever seen or been in a room when two people say by accident the same things at once? And you go, whoa, you couldn't have planned that any better. That's kind of what happened here, the same exact thing. They spoke at the same time. So Mary sees and she hears these two angelic beings saying the same thing at the same time. Now that word for woman there is the word gyna, from where we get our word gynecologist. And it can mean woman, but it also means wife. It can mean lady or ma'am. So where it sounds like these angels are being very harsh with Mary, 
what they're actually doing is being very respectful. It's like saying, ma'am, yes, ma'am, if you were in the military. That is a, a sign of respect. So it's not a put down, but a term of respect. Why are you crying, Mary? Why are you wailing? Why are you mourning? There's no dead people here, Mary. Then Mary says, because someone has taken my Lord. Essentially, they've carried away his body. They've stolen it. Verse 14. Now, when she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. So maybe it was the tears that were streaming down her face. We don't know. Or maybe she had light in her eyes. Maybe even the light from the angels. Maybe she was in shock from her previous encounter with these angels. Or maybe it was the fact that the grave clothes were laying there on the bench, but this man that was talking to her was in bright, clean clothes. We don't know. But for whatever reason, Mary does not recognize Jesus Christ. She does not see Jesus for who he really is, but she thinks he's the gardener. And sometimes, how often do we do that in our lives, where we try to put God in our box, in our own little box, and he doesn't quite fit into the box that we try to put him in. Where God is trying to work and we're saying, no, Lord, you must be mistaken. I don't want to go there or I don't want to do that. Really not believing who God is. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. So Jesus, again, repeats the same phrase that the angels had. Woman, gyna, lady, ma'am, why are you weeping? Why are you mourning, Mary? Didn't you believe me when I said I would rise again? And who are you seeking? Or you might say, who do you say I am? Because doesn't God do that to us all the time? Who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus to you today? Is he just a cosmic guy in the sky that uh, messes up your fun? Or is he the big Santa Claus in the sky that just gives you things when you need him? Or is he truly the Lord and Savior of your life that you try and follow each and every day? Who do you say that he is? A dead Messiah? Or do you seek the living God, Jesus Christ? The Messiah who, deeded, who defeated death. In Luke, the angels even reminded Mary and the other woman of who Jesus was. This is recorded in Luke chapter 24, verse five. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, who, why do you seek the living among the dead? Mary, why are you looking for dead people among the living? I'm not dead, Mary. Jesus repeatedly told Hallelujah. the disciples that he would suffer and die, but that he would rise again on the third day, defeating death. And it was day three, Mary. Who or what are you seeking? Notice here, Jesus speaks the same phrase, the same exact phrase that the angels had just spoken. Why? Because a real angel, a true angel, is a messenger of God. And what an angel says will never contradict what God's word says. A true angel, a true messenger of God, will never add to God's word or take away from it. So those angels, just like fellow servants of God, just like us, created beings, we do not have permission to change God's word, to add to it. We are ambassadors, and an ambassador respects the word of his sovereign, Jesus Christ. Yeah. We must all speak God's message exactly as it is given. We do not have permission to change it. So these were not their words, these were God's words, and angels are no doubt active today in the lives of believers. But a true angel, a true messenger of God, his message will never contradict, never add to, never take away from what the Bible actually says. That is our baseline. That is our benchmark. That's how we know it is true, saints. Now back to Mary. Was it the tears in her eyes or her encounter with the angels? Why didn't she recognize Jesus? Well, in short, it was likely intentional on the Savior's part. You see, he had done the same thing to two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus. This is recorded over in Luke 24. For the, the, state, the sake of time this morning, we're not gonna go there, but I urge you to read it yourself. He blinded their eyes 
for a while, for a season, for a moment. He blinded the eyes of Israel in the same way and continues to blind their eyes today. But this gives us hope as the church because God is not done with his church yet. He is still adding to it. Amen. If you look around at the church worldwide today, most of the church is comprised of Gentile believers. There are some Messianic Jews, and we're blessed to have Messianic Jews within our ranks. But the vast majority of Israel, God has blinded their eyes for a season. And when he is done with the Gentile world, when the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles is full, God will once again turn his attention, attention towards his beloved Israel. And he will redeem Israel to himself. These two disciples that were leaving Jerusalem towards Emmaus, they were walking away. They weren't seeking the Lord like Mary was. Mary waited at the tomb. She was seeking God. She was seeking her Lord. She was waiting on Jesus. But Mary, before the realization hits, before she knows this is Jesus, please see her heart here, what she's thinking. She thinks Jesus is the gardener, and she knows that his body must be nearby. And she says, tell me where he is, that I can carry him back to the tomb, that I will take care of this. She doesn't say, I will have the men come and carry him. She says, no, I'll take care of it. Now, Mary probably didn't have a weight problem like I do. She was probably about 110 pounds soaking wet. But Mary doesn't say, I'm going to have Peter and John do this. Mary says, tell me where my Lord is, and I will carry him. Amen. Mary was ready to take care of this task herself. Too often in our lives as Christians, when we see a task, we look at that as somebody else's job. We wait for someone else to do it rather than take care of that task ourselves. Often God will put something right in front of our noses for us to deal with. That's for us to deal with, mm -hmm. not somebody else. Not for the professionals. And in this way, Mary was taking care of that task herself. This was is what's called an, a, a divine appointment. And God had placed it right before Mary. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. You might also say rabbi. So Jesus speaks to her and suddenly she recognizes him. Was it his voice? Or did his appearance suddenly change? We don't know. But the blinders suddenly came off. And then Jesus addresses Mary using not the Greek name for her name, which would have been Maria, but instead Jesus refers to her by her Hebrew name, Miriam. Now remember, Mary grew up in Magdala, or the Magdalene region, up around the Sea of Galilee. This was the most Hellenized or Greek-influenced region in all of Israel. Likely, Greek would have been her first language. But Jesus calls her by her Jewish name. And she knows immediately when he says, Miriam. Miriam. And she knew it. She knew it was her Lord. She knew this was Jesus. And she cries out, Teacher, Rabbi, Rabboni, it's you. She addresses him as teacher. He healed her. Remember, he was the one that cast out the demons. So she was saved through his ministry. He cast out seven demons from her. In the Bible, the number seven always refers to the number of completeness. So she was completely a mess, and Jesus had healed her completely. Mm -hmm. And he taught her how to live. Jesus lived as her example for life. Now, Jesus can be our example for life if we will only let him. How do we know how Jesus lived? We read his word. We read the Bible. We and not just read it to hear it, but we apply it in our Amen. life. What we read in there, we need to follow. It's as applicable today as it was back then. Jesus lived as an example to Mary, and he lives as an example to you and to me today. Verse 17, almost done. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. So he says, don't attach to me or cling to me, Mary. I'm not leaving. I'm not done yet. Now, if you happen to have a King James Version Bible, your version is going to say, do not touch. And a lot of Bible scholars 
They try to make this say that Jesus somehow would have been defiled by Mary touching her. But that's not really what's going on. Really, he's saying, I'm not done yet, Mary. I'm still busy about my father's work. Don't hang on me. Don't slow me down. But watch this. Watch this. Go and tell my brothers. Go and tell my family that I am risen, that I am alive, that I'm risen from the dead. Now, who is Jesus' family? Is it his brothers and sisters, biological? Or is it you and me? Think about this for a second. This is recorded over in Matthew chapter 12, verses 48 through 50. Verse 48, but he answered and said to the one who told him. And this was when Jesus was told, hey, your family is waiting for you outside, Jesus. They want to talk to you. Jesus says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So at the time that his family came to see him that day when this is written in Matthew, we know for a fact that Jesus' biological brothers, two of which wrote, wrote books in the New Testament, James and Jude, they did not believe in Jesus. They thought he was a fraud. They didn't become followers of Jesus Christ until after he had risen from the dead. For what Jesus is saying here to Mary is go tell my family, go tell my church family, go tell those that actually believe that I am who I said I am. Tell them I am alive. Tell them I, I am risen. Jesus is saying, go to the other faithful ones. That's my family. And tell them there is hope. The death is to man and where I'm going up to heaven, you're going also. That you have eternal life because of the Father's love for you and for all mankind. God demonstrated his love for us by dying for us first. This is in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now all the disciples that are mentioned in the Bible, with the exception of John the Beloved, the one that Jesus loved, they all died horrible martyrs' deaths. Now the, mar the word martyr in the New Testament is the Greek word for witness. And it means to be a witness even unto death. That's what we're called to do, to share the good news of Jesus Christ even unto our own death, to have courage in Christ and to tell a dying world around us that Jesus is risen from the dead, that there is hope. Now, he did not say that he was a good man. Jesus didn't claim to be a prophet. He didn't come as a king, not the first time. He came as a lowly king, but next time he'll come as a conquering king. But he claimed that he was God. So either he was the biggest fraud of all time, or he was who he said he was, the savior of the world. But if he is a fraud, if it wasn't true, then why is the world still offended by him? Why is there still, still such contention about him 2,000 years later? He is the most fought over, the most argued over, the most contentious human being who ever lived. And if it wasn't true, those disciples that all died a horrible death, they all had a chance to recant their statements, to turn around, and they would have saved their earthly lives. But each and every one of them chose to die a martyr's death rather than deny Jesus Christ. Jesus. That's because it was true. Amen. It was true for them then, and it's true for us today. Amen. They all chose to follow Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, this is a faithful saying, saying, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Hallelujah. If we endure... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Remember, Peter denied Jesus, and Peter was fortunate enough to have a second chance. When I was a young policeman, shortly after I got saved, I also denied Jesus before one of my partners. I was embarrassed by him. And then conviction came in. And I'll tell you for a fact, guys, I will never, ever deny him again. Amen. Don't deny Jesus Christ. We don't always get a second chance like myself or Peter. On this day, the most important day on the Christian calendar, come to Jesus Christ today. Amen. 
God loves you. He has a good plan for you. And I want you to get to heaven. You can't do it on your own. You can't be good enough. You can't be good enough. You possibly can't be good enough. The Bible calls our righteousness filthy rags. The Bible says you must be born again. And what does it mean to be born again or born from above? The Apostle Paul lays it out very clearly in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's simple as this. You confess or you speak the truth that Jesus is the Lord. You must believe it in your heart that it's true. Now, again, the Bible is not one book, but it's 66 different books written by over 40 different authors over a 2,000 year period in three different languages and not a single contradiction. Mathematically, that can't happen by random chance, nor can the over 300 prophecies concerning who the man Jesus would be, where he would be born, and even how he would die. It's mathematically impossible. We don't have a blind faith in Jesus Christ. We have a scientific, mathematical uh, faith that is impossible to recreate. Man. It is not random chance. He is who he said he is. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, do it today. You can do it right from your car. You can do it where you're at, sitting in your, in your easy chair at home. Let's close in a word of prayer. And I want to lead you all in a sinner's prayer. Now, if you've already said this prayer, you don't have to say it again. But if you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, just repeat after me. And the Bible says that if you believe this, if you truly believe these things that you're saying, you believe it in your heart, then you will be saved. That means your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If we are to die today, we will go to heaven together. Amen. You'll be in paradise for all time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I know that Jesus is Lord. I know that He is the Son of God. I know that He died for my sins. And I know He rose again from the dead. I know, Jesus, that You are alive today. I know that that tomb is empty. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life right now. And I choose to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer and you meant it, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. You are saved. Mm -hmm. Let's close our service right now and worship together. Craig, lead us on, brother. <laughs> Just as long as I see you.
had to turn my mic off so you wouldn't hear my awful singing. <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank Craig and Fred mm -hmm. and Tara and all those thank you. ministry volunteers who have stood out Steve. here in the cold. I know that Lewis. I can't feel my fingers, so I know that uh, Craig is, must be really struggling trying to strum that guitar. So God bless you, brother. Thank you very much. God bless all you guys. I really appreciate it. Our benediction this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, and it says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I just pray your blessings. I pray for safety on each and every person that is here today.